Welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or other information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. The title for this morning's message I've given is simply The Foolishness of God. The Foolishness of God. It's words taken from that reading that we had from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 25, where Paul says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, Paul, in the first nine verses of this this epistle, presents us with the, the positional status of these Christians here in Corinth. He speaks that they've been sanctified in Christ Jesus. He says that they are now called saints, that they've been graced by God, that they have been gifted by God, and that they have been guaranteed that in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be guiltless because of the faithfulness of God. But then, sadly, from verse 10, Paul begins to deal with the present reality with this congregation. In responding to the report that has come to him from Chloe's people, that which you find in the 11th verse, the apostle Paul now turns to the Lord's people to look at them now in light of, of their calling. And he has to deal first of all with factions that have developed within the church. Factions that have arisen from their glorification of men and of their giving allegiance now to men. So that as you find within the 12th verse, some are saying, I, I am of Peter. Others saying, I am of Apollos. Others saying, I, I'm Paul's man. And even some saying, I, I'm for Christ. Here they were boasting about who they were. The emphasis being on I, I am. And this is the first problem that the apostle seeks to deal with. This this element of boasting, this element of self-promotion, this element of look at me, what a great Christian I am. How does Paul deal with this faction? How does he deal with this this division, this, this boasting, this pride that was now being evident within the church? He deals with it basically with two words, wisdom and power. Wisdom and power. That God's wisdom and power that was supremely displayed in the cross of Christ, which to man doesn't seem like wisdom and power at all, but rather foolishness and weakness. And so what we find here is this great divide between a holy God and sinful man. For what men and women think is wisdom and power, God calls foolishness and weakness. While what God calls wisdom and power men and women regard as foolish and weakness. And so from verse 18 through to verse 5 of chapter 2, Paul illustrates this great fundamental difference and divide, this fundamental difference in the way of thinking and seeing and recognizing and applying. And he deals with this in three ways. He deals with wisdom and power in the message of the cross 
and then in the members of the church, and then in the manner of communication. The message of the cross, verses 18 through 25. And you notice here, first of all, that Paul refers to two companies of people. Those who are perishing and those who are being saved. And each has a different view of the gospel, that which Paul simply classifies as and speaks of as the word of the cross. Two different views. To one group, the perishing, this word of the cross, this gospel, it's absolutely foolishness. But to the other group, to those who are being saved, the word of the cross is the power of God. Indeed, it is the wisdom of God. Verse 24. Now, why has this come about? Why do we have these two companies? Why this distinction and this division? Well, it's due to the sovereign will and purpose of God. You look at what he says in verse 19. For here he quotes from the Old Testament, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Paul is quoting from Isaiah 29 and verse 14. But then he goes on to say in verse 20, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach, to save those who believe. Now, he's drawing our attention to two things here. The first is this. The first is this. God has decreed that men and women will never come to know him, will never come to walk with him, will never come to worship him by their own wisdom. Rather, it has pleased God instead that he will save, he will reveal himself, he'll declare himself by and through the word of the cross. Because the fact is, the world's wisdom and God's wisdom are in opposition to one another. They are diametrically opposed to each other. Man's wisdom and God's wisdom cannot be reconciled because the wisdom of this world is a wisdom that keeps men and women from God. It does not bring them to God. The world in its wisdom does not know God. In fact, the world in its wisdom does not want to know God. They have their own gods. And so after speaking of these two companies, he then goes further to describe two cultures. Two cultures. Verses 20 through 2 through 25. Jew and Greek. The Jews were incensed by the claim of the Christians that Messiah had come and that he had come to be crucified. To them, Messiah's coming would be with great grandeur, would be with great glory. There would be great celebration. There would be great exaltation, not humiliation. 
Oh, when Messiah comes, he will come, and he will come as a great soldier. He will come as a great statesman. He will come as a national hero. Therefore, they demanded powerful signs to try to authenticate that Jesus was Messiah. But all that came to nothing. Because whilst they were expecting coronation, all they found was a message about crucifixion. And then the Greeks, on the other hand, they were seeking wisdom. Knowing God was a matter of their own reasoning, their own intellect, their own wisdom and understanding. And to say that the meaning of life was to be found in a Jewish rabbi who had been crucified outside Jerusalem, that to the Greeks, to the Gentiles, was absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. To speak of belief in Jesus Christ, who had been crucified as a state criminal, was to that culture, that Greek culture, a sick delusion, a senseless and crazy superstition. Yet Paul points to a common thread in these Jewish and Greek rejections of the Christian message. And it's a, it's a reason that is still revealed today. For you see, in neither case did they consider the threat of God's wrath against them for their sin. Whether they be Jew or whether they be Gentile, they did not entertain for a moment the thought of the wrath of the holy God. Verse 18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Perishing precisely because they do not know themselves to be perishing and therefore in need of salvation. They were never thinking in terms of being saved from their sin because they didn't believe that they needed to be saved from their sin. And so the Jews made their demands. The Greeks, what they were seeking for by their wisdom. And yet the Apostle Paul says, we proclaim, we proclaim, Because the gospel is not a suggestion. But the word of the cross is a dogmatic proclamation. And what do we proclaim? Ah, says Paul, it's Christ crucified. It's Christ crucified. The heart of the message is the cross so despised by this world. The word of the cross. If I may quote John Stott. Yes, the very cross that seems folly to men is yet the wisdom of God. It is the marvelous scheme by which God satisfies both his justice and his love and reconciles sinners to himself. And the cross that seems so weak and so futile to men just a a dead man hanging upon a tree, is yet the power of the living God by which he awakens the conscience, melts the heart, by which he wins the rebel and justifies the ungodly and brings forgiven sinners first to holiness and then to glory. Truly, as the apostle goes on in verse 25, The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God 
is stronger than men. And my dear friends, this morning, we who are here, if we are to be saved from the penalty of our sin, if we are to be saved from the wrath of a holy God, so that we will not perish and spend a hellish eternity, it will not be due to our wisdom or to our might or to our power or intellectual ability, but rather by the grace of God, it will be through the cross of Christ alone. Because salvation, what we so desperately need, even if we don't recognize it, but what we so desperately need is this salvation is of the Lord. The message of the cross, the foolishness, and yet the wisdom of God. To the world, foolishness, but to those who believe, it is precious. And so Paul highlights wisdom and power in the message of the cross. But then as he continues to write his epistle, he illustrates that point by referring to the members of the church. And I get that from verses 26 to 31. The members of the church. Selina Hastings, Countess of Huntingdon, was one of the great evangelical noble women during the 18th century evangelical awakening. She was a supporter and a patron of the early Methodists, especially in the ministry of George Whitfield. And she used to say that she knew she was going to get to heaven thanks to the letter M to the letter M. And when she was asked what she meant, she would turn to our passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. And she would read verse 27 in particular, which says, not many were of noble birth. And she would say, it does not say not many any, but not many. And so she says she got in on the account of the letter M, the many. She understood that her high social status played no part in securing her eternal destiny. She knew that she had to look to the the free grace of a sovereign God in the gospel of Christ Jesus. She grasped the point that the apostle was making. She knew that her pedigree, her social standing did not matter at all, only the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Not many, but she believed by God's grace. So how did Paul describe the social status of these Corinthians? The social stature of these Corinthians, who, according to this world standards, who were these Corinthian Christians? Well, you start reading the text and you find it's put in rather clear terms. Not many were wise, not many were influential, not many were powerful, and not many were of noble birth. Now, Paul is not being judgmental or offensive here. He's simply stating the facts. That these people here in this church at Corinth were simply ordinary people. If you want to get their background, you read chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. I know there were exceptions, 
But by and large, this congregation, they, they, they weren't amongst the elite of society. They, they weren't from the upper class in society. And then in verse 27, Paul goes on a little bit, little bit further, declaring that in reality they were foolish, weak, low, and despised in the eyes of the world. I wonder how you'd feel if your guest preacher came to you and said, looking at all of you here, I don't see very many noble people here. You look pretty ordinary to me. But isn't that the truth, beloved? These people in the church of Corinth, they were nobodies. They were just nobodies. They were people without pedigree. People without pedigree. That was their social status. But then Paul goes on to describe their spiritual status. You go back to verse 26, where he says, Consider your calling, brothers. And what's the conclusion? It's something that God has done, not something which they did. And you get a repeated phrase in verses 27 and 28, and the repeated phrase is this, but God chose, but God chose, but God chose. Who has God chosen? The feeble in mind, says one commentator. The feeble in personality. The feeble in social status. Over and over again, the apostle lays the emphasis on the electing choice of God. And because of his electing love and sovereign grace, these people were now nobodies in Christ Jesus. Now in union with the high king of heaven. And so what's Paul's point? Surely it is this, that our status in Christ, our salvation by Christ, our security through Christ is entirely and solely the result of the grace of God. It has been God's will and it has been God's work. And so he goes on in verse 29 to say, we have therefore absolutely no ground for boasting. Why are you boasting? You remember the words of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace that you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Lest any man should boast. And why does Paul write that? And why, need, why do we need to hear it again this morning? Because is it not true, brothers and sisters, that we too, like the Corinthians, are oft times prone to pride and prone to boasting? It may be boasting about our nationality. It may be boasting about our spiritual maturity. It may be pride in our family or our ability or our orthodoxy or, or our church or the job that we have and the position that we hold. Because you see, beloved, there's a Pharisee that lives within each of us. There's a Pharisee in each of us. I am of such and such and I am of this one. We may not declare it, but we may think it. Prone to pride. And tragically, we all have a tendency to think of ourselves better than others. And yet the tragedy is that boasting, the emphasis on the I am, I myself, contradicts the gospel. And that is why pride is so basically evil, because it is a denial 
of the word of the cross. As someone put it, when we are humbled at his feet, we are in our right posture. And when we acknowledge that with God alone are might and dominion and true wisdom, we are in our right minds. And yet in saying all of that, verse 31 there's a productive and a positive statement about boasting. Not sinful, godless boasting, but scriptural, godly boasting. As it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the law. Paul is quoting from Jeremiah verse, chapter 9, verse 24, where boasting was in a Godward direction, a Christocentric boasting, a boasting in this way, let, let me try and put it this way. You know, sometimes we, there is a, a sense that boasting can be natural to us. We, we, we maybe like to boast about our children, about our family, and so forth. But listen, and, and I hope I'm not cheapening things, but listen. We can boast in the fact that we have an older brother that we have a true brother, that we have a brother who is king of kings and lord of all the lords. You want something to boast about? You think you've got somebody important in your family? Isn't that fact of the Lord something to boast about? This is what we rejoice in, isn't it, beloved? This is what we, we live for. This is what we, we sing about. That though, though we be nobodies in today's society, though we are people without pedigree, listen, we are the people of God. We are a people who've been saved by the Lord. We are a people for his praise. How does Peter reply it from the Old Testament? We are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a people for God's possession. Haven't we got something to boast about? Something to glory? Something to praise and sing and magnify God with? The wise may boast in their wisdom. The mighty man may boast in his might. And the rich man may boast in his riches, but they will all perish and come to naught. But how wonderful, how exalting to boast in the Lord forever and ever. The foolishness of God, wiser than human wisdom. The foolishness of God, stronger than human strength. And you see it in the message of the cross. And you see it in the members of the church. And so thirdly and finally, you see it in the manner of communication. And this is why I go into chapter 2 in the first five verses. Because in these verses, Paul reminds these Corinthians, first of all, of the message he proclaimed. And what was it? Verse 2, Christ Jesus and him crucified. What was his message? The foolishness of the cross. The message utterly unlike anything worldly wisdom would ever devise. Showing us that the apostle did not shape his message in accordance with the anticipation of his audience. He comes to Corinth with no other message, in defiance of the fact that that message was regarded as ridiculous by the Greeks. Now, Paul was sensitive to his hearers. He longed to reach their hearts. 
but he refused to use, if I may say, the tricks of the trade in order to produce a result. He did not seek to try and create the right atmosphere. He did not warm up his congregation, you see, with a a few hearty jokes to begin with. He did not come and apply some emotional pressure. He did not adjust the message. He was captivated by a foolish and a weakness that his audience didn't understand. And yet he knew that that was the wisdom and the power of God. And then he reminded them of the manner in which he delivered that message. Just notice what he says here. No lofty speech or wisdom, rather weakness, fear, much trembling, not in plausible words of wisdom. What's the picture here? What do these words, what do these terms mean? Paul did not employ the techniques of the world. He did not speak in such a way as to distinguish himself above others. He did not speak in a way that drew attention to himself or to try and gather an audience to himself. As has been said, Paul was no Pericles. He was no Abraham Lincoln. He was no Winston Churchill. No Paul, though an extremely, an extremely clever man, a brilliant intellect as evidence from his writings. Paul did not rely on his ability or that eloquence of which the Corinthians were so enamored. But he relied on the truth the wisdom, the power of God and his message. Paul knew the difference between preaching Christ and him crucified and showing off, and showing off. To quote James Denny, no one can give at once the impression that he himself is clever and that Jesus Christ is mighty to save Do you get it? Let me give it to you again. No man can give at once the impression that he himself is clever and that Jesus Christ is mighty to save. You can't promote yourself while trying to promote Christ. What's the point Paul's making here? The message, beloved, the word of the gospel is to shape the manner of and the method of communication. In fact, it's to shape the preacher himself. Paul knew the difference between, as it has been said, getting the gospel out and branding his own recognized way of saying it. He knew the difference between winning disciples to Christ and attracting a following to himself. And my friends, in this, this age, this day of communication, we are not to be pragmatists, thinking of what's the best method, what's the best means that will attract and appeal to people. Every presentation even of truth, if it draws attention to that presenter and showcases his cleverness, such grieves the Spirit of God and empties the gospel of its power. The manner of communication, my friends, must accord with the message of the cross. The message being proclaimed is to be presented in the spirit of the crucifixion. 
And why? Well, finally, Paul reminds them of the motivation that drove him. And what was that? Verse 5. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That is, that their faith would not rest upon clever arguments or impressive presentations or even a charismatic personality or on the skill of an orator. But it was to rest simply, solely, wholly, totally upon the message of of the cross, delivered by one who manifested the very attitude and spirit of the cross. I'm sure you've heard it said before. I think it was one of the Puritans that said that the cross was the pulpit upon which Christ preached his love to the world. And that's the standard for every preacher. That's the standard for every preacher. The weakness and folly of the cross. Paul says, when I came, I didn't have my entourage. I wasn't booked in the five-star hotel down there in Corinth. He says, I was in weakness, trembling. The echoes of the cross. The echoes of the cross. Faith does not rest upon the man who is in the front. Faith does not rest upon the method being employed. But faith comes from what? The hearing of the word, the message of Christ and him crucified. And we have to acknowledge, do we not, that 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 message has never been popular. Because it cuts across the grain of human pride. It offers a different salvation than that which human beings expect or desire. But honestly and faithfulness compels us to go with this message because it is the only message that will do lost sinners good. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in 1941, had the opportunity to speak to the students at Oxford University. And after Lloyd-Jones had preached, he was mocked by a leading member of the Oxford Union Debating Society who said that, The sermon was better suited to a congregation of farm laborers than to educated undergraduates. But Lloyd-Jones replied that Oxford students were just ordinary common human clay and miserable sinners like everybody else. So their needs were precisely the same as those of agricultural laborers. That's Pauline thinking. The gospel, in all of its simplicity, and yet in all of its majesty. And the fact remains, this foolishness of God, so-called, the message of the cross was an impossible message It was a laughable message. It was a ridiculed message in the first century Corinth. But by God's wisdom and power, a multitude of people from all walks of life believed it and were transformed by it, and they are now in heaven because of it. The foolishness of the cross. And so Paul said to the Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and also to the Greek. Pride, Boasting, 
Oh, beloved, we boast in the foolishness of God, which is wiser than men. We boast in the weakness of God, which is stronger than man. We boast, and our boasting is in the Lord. May God bless his word to us this morning. Let's pray. Father, we recognize in the apostle faithfulness confronting the mentality of his world. We find in Paul a man aware of his own weakness and abilities, but knowing your power and trusting in you. Our Father, we pray for one another. We too may maintain that strength of faith, that though ridiculed and rejected and laughed at and despised, we too may walk humbly with you, rejoicing in the fact that we who are nothings are nevertheless the children of the living God. Stir our hearts, we pray of you. Bless us this day, we ask of you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.